Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Breakaway Podcast. I'm your host, John Root. I got a very special friend, an old teammate from Azusa Pacific University, goes from D2 tight end and long snapper to Super Bowl participant. And hopefully he's going to be a Super Bowl champion. I'm so excited for this. You know, we have a lot of great conversations on here and I couldn't be more excited to be ten- potentially talking to a Super Bowl champ. Matt Orzek, welcome to the Breakaway Podcast. What's going on, buddy? Root the boot, man. <laughs> I had to be here. I couldn't turn it down. I'm glad you start out with that because there's a lot of people that don't know my background. I've given people just little, little spurts. So root the boot. <laughs> That's what I was known as at Azusa Pacific because I punted there. I uh, started out playing tight end like you, but I got that herniated disc my my freshman year at junior college, a time that I really don't want to remember <laughs> at all, <laughs> and then jumped over to Azusa Pacific and uh, got connected with you. Honestly, I've had some good long snappers in my day. I've had some bad long snappers, but you are by far the best. But as of right now, can you tell us a little bit more about about your journey to Azusa Pacific, because you're a SoCal guy from San Diego, and I'm sure you never imagined being a long snapper full-time in the NFL. Mm, Definitely not a long (laughs) snapper. I mean, let alone the NFL. Like Growing up, baseball was all I dreamed about. So the only championship I ever really dreamed about was World Series. So it's kind (laughs) of ironic that it's the Super Bowl for me. Um, But yeah. Through high school, played defensive end and wide receiver. My junior year, I got a pretty nasty concussion at a seven-on-seven event. Went down with a seizure, and next thing I knew, it was eight hours later, and I was in the hospital. So we sat out all of junior season, which every athlete knows is your big recruitment year. Yep. Um, And obviously had to fight mom off of (laughs) playing football again ever after she got to witness that amazing moment because i feel like that's Um, something with with football too we've always been taught like hey are you hurt or are you injured and i feel like a lot of us yeah mom come on like this is my big recruitment year i gotta get better Mm -hmm. just just let me go through this yeah and i mean at that time concussions were still relatively under not understood at all yeah and so every doctor we talked to gave us a completely different answer there was one that was like yeah you should be good in like one to three weeks and then you (laughs) go back out there another doctor was like dude three to six months like minimum Mm -hmm. if you really want to be okay after this so it was just like kind of balancing all these different opinions and then what we thought was right for me and you know I thought of myself as a smart kid in high school so I was like well I want my brain to recover so I'm not playing this year (laughs) at all and I mean it turned out to be a good decision because throughout that semester of high school like midway through so probably two months after my concussion i would still have fits of vertigo sitting in the classroom so it was obviously the correct decision but uh yeah going into senior year getting recruited a little bit as i was starting on both sides of the ball and but nothing was really sticking because they wanted me to play tight end but i didn't have any film so Mm -hmm. a lot of the division one scouts would kind of fall out um And then really late on, like spring of my senior season, middle of baseball, I get hit up by Azusa Pacific, which my first question was, where is, where even is that? (laughs) How do you say that? Azusa? How do I say it? (laughs) And then find out that it's only an hour away from my home. So Mm. it was pretty awesome to hear that. And then went on a recruiting trip and fell in love with the culture. Yeah. Like every coach's office you went into, they had different scripture on the whiteboard and they were talking about their faith and their value of building men at their university versus just football players, which was a completely different sales pitch than I'd ever heard. Um, And then a week after I got hit up by Azusa Pacific's baseball coach and that made it just a home run for me. I was like, yeah, we're going uh, there. Paul Shvadkis at the time, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 So that just made it a no brainer decision. I had to do it. And then, which I think that's what ended up leading me to long snapping because my freshman year in practice, two weeks before our game against the number two team in division two football, Grand Valley state, mm-hmm. our long snappers having a little bit of issues. So Santa Cruz, our head coach yells at me to come over and I start 
freaking out. Like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I'm in trouble. And a lot of people have to know that uh, Coach Victor Santa Cruz, that guy was one of the nicest guys ever, but also one of the most intimidating coaches I've, yes. I know I've ever had. And now he's yeah. coaching over at the University of Hawaii. And obviously we're, we're to break down a little bit what that was like, how he built that, that culture. But if coach Victor Santa Cruz in your grill, you're just like, Oh God, what did I do? He just had a <laughs> voice too, a booming voice that mm. just, it hit some chord deep in your heart. <laughs> It'll just make you tremble. Uh, so he the fear of God is in me. you when coach Santa oh, Cruz. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So he yells at me to come over in the middle of practice. And I was like, I haven't heard my name once since I've been here. <laughs> um, and he's like, Hey, you're going to play baseball here, right? Like, yeah. Where's this, where's this going? He's like, you, you pitch. Yeah. You throw pretty hard. Like, yeah. I mean, pretty hard, hard enough. He's like, all right, you've heard a long snapping. No, I'm still pretty <laughs> new to football. He's like, all right, well, it's kind of like pitching, but between your legs. <laughs> Okay, dude. <laughs> like, I still, I still always love this story. Like that is how you became a long snapper. Is your head coach at your university telling you, yeah, it's just like pitching, but uh, you know, just kind of like bending down and and throwing it behind you. Upside with your down. Hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, I did it, and it was good enough to where he felt like I should just give it a shot. So the next two weeks, that was all I did. I didn't do tight end anymore for those two weeks, and then day before we leave for Grand Valley. Uh, he comes up to me before practice and tells me, Hey, we're thinking about red shirt and you and traveling you. So I got psyched. I was traveling. Yeah. But then after that walkthrough, uh, Gabe Heiger, the special teams coordinator and just ultimate man <laughs> comes up to me after that practice says, Hey man, you're starting. So you're ready. Like you're snapping. <laughs> I immediately was just paralyzed. <laughs> like I just started doing this, let alone doing it in a game on probably the biggest division two stage there was. And, uh, tell us about that very called, first snap though. This is, this is yeah. the kicker. Whole game. We're kind of driving. I think we had a few turnovers early, which embarrassingly, I was just like, praise God, like I don't have to snap. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a punt. Um, and then sure enough, we're on like, I don't even know the 15 yard line, which our own 15 yard line, which means the punter standing on the goal line. So I look between my legs. I look back at him. I'm just like, oh, God. Okay, just not over his head. He's like, just get it there. And I snap it. I take a few steps and hear the fans just going absolutely bananas. I turn around and I see Sean Barber, the punter, just running for his life, picks up the ball and punts it. And I was just like, well, that was a great career of college <laughs> football. My life is over. So I get to the sideline and Santa Cruz just says, well, you get the first one out of your system. And he gives me a high five. Yeah. And I mean, from that moment on, though, I didn't mess up. I just felt a different sense of confidence in the coaches mm -hmm. believing in me versus just looking for an excuse to move on to the next guy, mm -hmm. which was huge for me because it was my first time ever doing it in a game. And then to mess up on that scale was pretty incredible. Especially Grand Valley State. Uh, I know I didn't, I didn't travel for that game. And a lot of people, too, don't understand like D2 football. Not everybody travels. Like Sean Barber, he was our middle linebacker at that yeah. time so like normally if you wanted to travel you needed to be able to play multiple positions so i know that always put me behind the eight ball because it was kind of like i hurt my back again like i'm gonna be maybe like a fourth string tight end just in case they need to throw in there but like all i did was punt there so you know sean's a guy that's running double duty and grand valley state was like the big house basically of division two that's probably like the best way to compare what was going on yeah. there like they're a powerhouse and they had a and I big think they the biggest base. stadium yeah i think the biggest stadium division two and i don't even know it felt like there was a hundred thousand people there to me coming mm -hmm. from high school not playing in front of big crowds but it's probably yeah. i don't know thirteen thousand people yeah i mean it's such a, it's such a big crowd and then i know they ended up coming to azusa pacific and I know everybody listening to this you're probably shocked that you even hear about azusa pacific right now you probably Never heard of it yourself. It's funny, uh, <laughs> Matt. We got some of the production team in the in the background here. They said, uh, "Go Biola Eagles." <laughs> we got one of one of our producers from Biola. Hey, uh, Anthony, why don't you get a football team and then you can then you can talk. But also, oh, we can't talk anymore because we don't have a football team. 
that's that's the crazy yeah. part about this. You might be the only guy in the NFL that is playing whose university doesn't have a football team at, at yeah. all. Like, what's your thought behind that? I mean, I remember my rookie year, we were practicing against the Jaguars and they had Matt Overton that was snapping for them at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was from an extinct Division II football program too. And I remember hearing that. I was like, wow, that would suck to <laughs> not have like a school Little to go back know. to. Yeah. And sure enough, later on it would happen to me. And it's, you know, it's a weird feeling to not have a football program at this place where you feel like you gave so much of your, I mean, I credit almost everything in my development as a man and a football player to that place. So to not have those spaces and people to kind of connect with and, you know, give that glimmer of hope to a division two football kids that, Hey, you can make it to the NFL. So you know, that part hurts, but at the same time, you understand it's a small school, small market in Southern California. It's tough to have fans and make money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a definitely difficult decision, especially when we go through the, the whole pandemic and a lot of universities are trying to figure out how to make money, where to spend money. And I know a lot of people want to hear about, you know, what happened this season with the Rams and making it to the Super Bowl. But I think it's important kind of covering some stuff about where you came from and then even your journey. So getting a little bit more into Azusa, and then we're going to talk about your journey going from like the Ravens to the Jaguars to the Dolphins <laughs> to the Titans. Like You've been all over the place. But yeah. I want to echo what you've said is it was so incredibly sad to me when we heard that Azusa Pacific was no longer going to have a football team. Because when I mentioned earlier, I think we've had some of these conversations too in person, Matt, that I went to a junior college that was, you know, pretty solid in Northern California, Sierra College. But man, my coach there, he was, man, if, if I put it frankly, if Adolf Hitler was a football coach, it was <laughs> Coach Tisdale at Sierra College. Like that guy would rip into you and he was there to just assert his dominance not to break someone down in order to build them back up but man we had a horrible season and i just felt like the whole coaching staff there it was i can take vulgar language a lot of people can playing sports but there was this sense of are you building up men it didn't feel like it and man i ended up hurting my back uh, getting a herniated disc the second to last game of the year and I wasn't even allowed to stand on the sideline because he thought I was being a wimp. And I wasn't even allowed wow. to go into the post-game huddle. And the last time I saw my coach was him saying, no, just, just go to the locker room. So from there, I'm just like, I, I want to be around a good coaching staff that really cares about me as a man. And at Azusa Pacific, nobody did it better. We were the only Division II school in Southern California when you got the UCLA's, the USC's. You got the University of San Diego, San Diego State, a lot of big D1 schools down there, but they were there to build us up as men because they knew and they would be frank with us. Dude, most of you guys, 99.9% .9 are not even going to get a shot at the NFL. And if you do, you probably won't last that long. Like I know uh, Terrell Watson, definitely a good buddy of ours, uh, had a nice little career, was jumping around from practice squad to practice squad, but you know, one of the leading rushers in the history of Division II football. It's tough to make it there, but I think the biggest thing I learned about Azusa was building us up as, they would call it warrior men, building us up as Christ followers, someone that could not only contribute to the football team, but can contribute to society and contribute to the kingdom of God. And when I heard that the team was no longer going to be a part of Azusa Pacific University, they're totally uh, dismantling that whole program. It, it just really bummed me out because I think that had a chance to change you know, thousands of more lives from, from years to come. And it was, it was so sad, but I'm super thankful for the time that we had there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was kind of the same thing for me. I'm just feeling like that legacy in that place was ending, but you know, there's a lot of alumni that are out there doing big things. Like, I mean, you are now talking to the public about all the experiences we had. We have, I mean, countless guys that went on to become coaches that are creating their own new spheres of impact. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's not dead, right? It's mm -hmm. still living on. And then tell us about your journey to to the NFL. 
because obviously mm. you were a tight end like you were talking about. You had that first experience at Grand Valley State, and then you kept snapping. I know you always gave me some some good snaps as as a punter. I always want it right here, in my right hip. That's and I feel like that's where I always got it in those games that I played. You're always fantastic there. And tell us a little bit more about how you know Coach Heigerd built you up, uh, the special teams coach there at Azusa Pacific University, to get you prepared for the draft, the combine, and everything. Yeah, I mean, the whole time there, I was I considered myself a tight end who could snap. So my entire goal was to be a starting tight end because that was what I, you know, signed up for. And the NFL was such a, I don't even think it was a possibility in my mind. Um, so my entire effort was focused on trying to become a tight end, uh, which Coach Higer, the special teams coordinator, was double duty. He was also our strength coach. And I really bought into all of his training philosophies and everything like that. And, and he's a freaking wild my, man. We get, it's like Everyone wild, needs dude. to know that. That is probably the craziest special teams coach I- yeah. in the country. Such a, such a great guy. And he, what, he was uh, ex-Special Forces, right? He was an Army Ranger, yeah. captain, I'm pretty sure. Um, and while he was our strength coordinator, special teams coach, he was also trying to get his doctorate and had <laughs> – I think four or five kids at that time. So the dude is the ultimate man. Like he you would does think it all. he was a Mormon father with the amount of kids that he was yeah. popping out. <laughs> yeah. And he's just doing everything all the time. And seems like he has infinite energy, infinite time. So he's just an awesome dude to look up to. And I mean, throughout my first three or four years at APU, I put on almost 50 pounds, I think. So I really finally filled out my frame and was finally considered, you know, kind of fast, not really fast <laughs> guy, but I wasn't slow anymore, yep. which I credit pretty much entirely to him. And all of his programming was awesome. Uh, and then he also connected me with a uh, long snapping coach, Matt Wigley based mm-hmm. here in Southern California. And I mean, that was the first time I'd ever been coached on long snapping. Like I would just kind of, pure talent as they say like you just kind of figured out on the fly yep didn't have a technique or anything it was just dumb luck and some whatever athleticism that i have um so i went to him like once or twice every off season just to make sure i wouldn't screw it up uh and i think it was my third year when terrell watson was a senior as we talked about how he was just on a record setting pace i think he was the leading rusher in all levels his senior year. So he had some NFL attention kind of being redirected his way. And people got to remember then, too, like us coming from Azusa Pacific University, like our claim to fame is Christian Okoye, the Nigerian nightmare. Yeah. The guy from the Kansas City Chiefs. Like I remember when he came to practice with Eric Dickerson uh, one mm-hmm. day, like Terrell Watson, he had the Christian Okoye feel. Like that guy was an absolute superstar. Uh, it seemed on, unstoppable. On <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then every now and then the scouts and they'd come to see him, they'd stop off before practice and they'd watch me snap. And I was like, this is interesting. You know, it didn't really sink in that they're actually watching mm. until the next year in camp when we had a scout come in and he talked to me before practice saying that they were really looking at me. And then from that moment on, my whole world just kind of, Blew up, blew up into like a whole new possibility that I'd never really considered. And then that season, I ended up getting hurt, tearing my MCL. So that kind of put the brakes on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was also a big blessing because I was so immature and long snapping still that I didn't really have a technique. And then obviously, before I could do tight end drills coming off an MCL, I could still snap. So I started to really plug into that craft and learn a little bit more about it, spend more times and lessons. Uh, and then going into that final senior season, we had a special teams coach come in that used to work with the Rams, funny enough. And he was like a special teams analyst guy, uh, Will Rodriguez. And he would constantly tell me like, Matt, you've got it. Like you've got what it takes. Like all you have to do is, you know, have an awesome pro day and you're going. And I still would kind of dismiss it. Like, dude, that's such a crack pipe dream. <laughs> like that's not realistic at all. We're division two guys. 
and I've always had a little bit of a distaste for the guys that think that they're going big time. Yeah. It just sounds so conceited and things like that. So like, I was so afraid to own it as a real goal. And then at one point, right before I started my pro day training after my last game, I was like, you know, I kind of have to put all my eggs into this basket. It's such a crazy thing to say you're going for. But I was like, I have to own it. I have to tell people if they ask what you're going to do after you graduate, say, I'm going to try to play in the NFL. Mm. And it sounded so <laughs> ridiculous to say. Um, but sure enough, you know, pieces started to fall together. Uh, that Will Rodriguez connected me with an agent who's pretty well established in the special teams uh, sphere. So I had influence and again, more validation of saying, hey, I've seen it. I think you've got it. So I kind of just would affirm all those kind of insecurities I had to be, okay, maybe it's not that crazy. Maybe, okay, maybe, you know, keep climbing that uh, idea of it being a reality. And then I had a private workout with the Saints, which, again, getting that phone call, I was playing video games on my couch with my roommate. I get a call or a text saying, hey, this is so-and-so from the Saints. Uh, you have time to call? And I was like, uh, sure. And they called me immediately. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what the heck is happening? <laughs> I guess I could put the video out. games down and give you some time to chat. Yeah, I was just like, oh my gosh, like this is happening. And, you know, and then had another workout later with the Ravens. Mm -hmm. So just these Who little, eventually picked little you moments. Up, right? Yeah, and these yeah. moments kind of adding up, kind of just blowing the roof off of what I thought was possible. Uh, and then going into the draft, trying to keep my expectations low mm -hmm. and my really just what I was expecting of the day um, and trying to stay kind of disconnected from the draft because it doesn't really matter to me anyways. I'm going to go undrafted. Yeah. But it's so hard not to get, to get stressed the mm -hmm. whole three-day process. Uh, and then on draft day, the Ravens called. And they have one of the best long snappers in the history of the game, Morgan Cox. Mm -hmm. uh, and they their sales pitch is, hey, we have a history of developing specialists. And we, I mean, best case scenario, you beat out an amazing snapper and you're our guy. And worst case, you get cut and you're twice the snapper you were when you came here and you probably get claimed. So that's what I think is I so win. cool about that story. Sorry to catch you off, Matt. Is yeah, no, you're good. There's times where like a lot of people they look to the draft, and then obviously you got people like Aaron Rodgers, who's probably gonna become the MVP of the league, but he was behind Brett Favre. And mm -hmm. obviously, like Aaron Rodgers got drafted and everything, but too many people look into like, hey, if I get drafted or I get picked up, I gotta go right into that starting role, or I gotta be the star, I gotta be the man. But the fact that they laid out those expectations for you, you're just like, I mean, I didn't go for this dream of being in the NFL and saying like, oh, I just, if I don't beat somebody out, I'm just, I guess that dream's over. I'll move on. The fact that they're saying, hey, we're yeah. going to build you up um, as a long snapper, that must have made you elated. Yeah, it definitely did. And just having that understanding of what they expected from me was huge because, you know, I definitely wasn't anticipating that kind of honesty of what I was getting myself into. And I was just elated to have an opportunity in the NFL to wear, you know, that little logo on your chest that says yeah. NFL was the coolest thing on earth. Um, and it honestly, it couldn't have worked out any better. Those guys there did everything they could to help me and they don't need to. I mean, like Morgan Cox, I'm there to take his job essentially. And he's completely, giving himself to me to help me learn how to better get into the protection on hunt schemes and how to understand the fronts and all this stuff that goes into being an NFL snapper. Like he didn't need to do that. And it was incredible. Like him, uh, Justin Tucker and Sam cook, that whole special teams crew just took me in as if I'd been there forever and was going to be there forever. It was a really special time. Yeah, and then what a guy to be with Justin Tucker, somebody that I always want to make sure I pick up in fantasy, no doubt. He's out. <laughs> he's always one of the been one of the best and most clutch kickers. Uh, I'm sure there's a little bit of you that was rooting for him when he was um, 
helping uh, put himself in the history books to this last year. Yeah. He, I mean, when you're in there for that long and you know those three guys so well, like you can't help but root for them when they're awesome guys. And I mean, that three guy group of Morgan, Sam, and Justin, they'd been together eight years. Mm-hmm. So it was an elite group that completely knew each other, were friends, had awesome chemistry. So it was like, there couldn't have been a better group to learn from and see what it's supposed to look like at that level. And it was, uh, yeah, I just couldn't place a value on that entire experience. And then was there some doubt that went through your mind at at some point too? Because obviously you jumped into the Ravens. You're like, man, this is going to be tough to try to beat this guy out, but I know I'm going to be, it would have built up as a long snapper, but there's never anything that is guaranteed. Like you can learn from the best. You become as good as you want to be, but you still got to be picked up by by some new teams. And you hopped around, man. You were with the Jaguars and the Dolphins, and then now eventually uh, you were led to L.A. back to your your hometown, um, pretty close yeah. to where you grew up in in Southern California. Was there ever some doubt that was going through your mind, wondering where where God's kind of leading you, or if you really have what it takes? Of course, I mean, especially like. After I got cut from the Ravens, I was totally geared up for that. I understood what was happening. Um, But then I got claimed by the Jaguars, which everybody talked to about being a specialist in the NFL. They say, once you're in, you're in. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just unless you mess up, then they're going to cut you. But otherwise, you could do that for 20 years, all this stuff. So I think I kind of drank that tea a little bit too much. Yeah. Because my rookie year, I played all 16 games in Jacksonville which was a complete surprise to me. And then going into my second season, I just, I don't think I knew how to be a pro in the off season yet. And I was a little too prideful to reach out and ask guys what they do and, you know, all that stuff. So I kind of lost a little bit of my edge of consistency and snapping. So I ended up getting released, which immediately all the, the things that I learned at APU kind of came to mind of control what you can control all you can do is attitude and effort, right? Mm -hmm. Like own your mistakes, own your failures, understand what led to them so you can learn from it and move on. So from that moment on, I kind of took an honest look at myself. I was like, well, you slacked off. Like there's areas of your game that you definitely need to be better at and need to have a higher standard for in the off seasons when you're practicing on your own and training. So I learned a lot from that. And then, getting signed to practice squad and the dolphins was just really, I mean, honestly, it was a great place to be for stability and kind of just a fresh location. And I was able to work with another snapper again and bounce ideas off each other and just wait for my opportunity to get a shot at being uh, an active roster snapper again, which I thought was coming when the Titans claimed me because they'd Mm -hmm. had some issues with, uh, you know, missed snaps, bad operation. So they claim me to active roster, which they have to do. If they claim you from a practice squad, you have to be up for three games. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, that was all right. Now I got my job because they they kind of hedge their bets on me yeah. <laughs> and they're wasting a roster spot for three games if they don't use me. Um, but they had a guy on practice squad, Matt Overton, who was with the Jaguars yep. that I kicked out of Jacksonville, actually. <laughs> uh, and he was there. And he, by the time I cleared COVID protocols, after the five days of negative tests and all that stuff, it was Sunday. So they went, let him go instead of having me snap after being in a hotel for five days and never practicing. So they went with him and he locked it down. Like the dude couldn't miss a snap yep. <laughs> for anything. He was just <laughs> nails. And so I was kind of kicking myself like, well, there goes that opportunity because, you know, the special teams unit, if you've had some shakiness and then you get some stability, you're just going to stick with it. And that must have been tough being in quarantine, too. I mean, if you're just stuck to a hotel room, you're there for five days and all you're thinking about is mechanics and all you're thinking about is Overton and all you're thinking about is like, I want this roster spot. And I know we've talked so much on this show about you know, going through the pandemic and then COVID protocols and everything, it must have been just really difficult mentally to try to stay in tune because you were there to get a job, provide for your family and keep your career going. 
yeah i mean it was really hard not to get ahead of yourself because i mean you got all that time to think and so you're just planning out okay where do we want to live out here and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. that has nothing to do with where you are in the moment which was just waiting for that shot um, so it was really easy to kind of get ahead of yourself, stress yourself out, all that. Um, and then when the opportunity doesn't come your way again, you feel defeated, but then I quickly rebounded to like, well, could I have controlled anything better in that situation? Mm-hmm. No. So I can't, like, I'm not going to get hung up over it. I'm just going to, you know, be on practice squad, stay ready in case anything, God forbid happened to Overton, I'd be ready to step in and, uh, help the team and then at the end of season sign me to a futures deal and they didn't bring him back uh so I was like all right here we go now yep. it's my shot uh and then a month later in free agency they signed my mentor morgan cox from baltimore <laughs> <laughs> so i was like well at least i get to compete with this guy again uh and probably learn a lot and get a lot better than you know i might take it from him this time <laughs> yep. i talked to him about that before uh and we were pretty excited mutually to be together again and compete to make each other better. Uh, and then a few weeks later, they're having some roster shifts where they're trying to add some depth in other places. And if you don't need to have a competition at long snapper, you're not gonna, cause I mean, you know, you're getting an all pro long snapper in Morgan Cox mm. versus me. Who's still semi unproven young snapper. So they let me go and <laughs> it wavers again. I got claimed by Jack or, uh, by the Rams, which had my special teams coordinator from Jacksonville mm. and Joe D. Camillus. So I had a familiar face that I was going. Man, aren't you stoked like, that you're with the L.A. Rams now? You're off to oh, the man. you're off to the Super Bowl, and it's been an absolute incredible journey watching you. Like everybody listening, that's why. Like I'm sure a lot of people tuning in, they're going to be watching this, they're going to be listening to this, and they're thinking like, I, I want to hear about the Super Bowl. I want to hear about the playoffs. And it's like, I think these stories are so important because it is so dang tough to not only make it to college football, but go from college football at D2 to the NFL. And then that's an absolute roller coaster ride that you just went through. And then eventually it leads to being a part of a special teams unit that's going to the Super Bowl. And I know I'm so glad I finally got to see you play this, this last year. And you talk about one of your mentors. I went to that game. You guys played uh, the Titans at SoFi Stadium. That definitely is not a game you guys want to remember. But maybe that was one of those games where it was a a gut check. And it's just like, all right, who are we as a team? And also, no matter what, too, sometimes as a special teams unit, you got some garbage time. But you still are there to do your job. You got to put points on the board and, and feel good about your performance. And it doesn't matter you know, what the offense did or the defense or turnovers or, or whatever. It's been incredible seeing your journey and I think seeing your, seeing your perseverance here. Um, tell us a little bit more about the playoffs and, and going through that ride because you beat up the Cardinals. Um, that's a little NFC West rivalry there. Um, you took on the 49ers in the NFC Championship game. You're able to beat the Bucks. I mean, it's been a crazy, a crazy journey for you. Tell us a little bit more about what it was like going through those playoffs and those tough games. Yeah, I mean, all season long, we've really felt just this really quiet confidence to our our whole team throughout the whole locker room. Um, and in those moments of adversity in games, we just really, it doesn't feel like too much or anything that we can't overcome. And it's across the board. No one's pointing fingers at each other. Everyone's just like, hey, we got this. We're just going to keep snapping it, keep rolling, and things will come together and we'll make it happen. Um, so, I mean, through those tough losses in season, we still had that feeling that, okay, we're going to find our rhythm and we're going to roll. And if we're rolling, we're one of the most talented teams in the league. And mm-hmm. it's no secret with, I mean, shoot, the names we have on this team yeah. that if we're clicking – it's going to be tough to stop us. Um, and so we kind of had that same quiet confidence in each other and that trust in everybody in those first games. And even in Tampa, when like, it seems like, Oh no, Tom Brady's about to do it again. No one on our team was panicking. No one was freaking out at each other. 
we just stayed calm, collected, understood the assignment, what we had to do. Uh, and you're it all tell, came you're, together. You're telling me there's no part, there's no part of you sitting there. Like, obviously you guys got a confidence. You got to do what you got to do as a special teams unit, but it's, yeah. there's got to be a little slimmer in, in every bit of somebody that's on the LA Rams or anybody that's going against Tom Brady, where it's like, no lead is safe. The, the absolute goat is trying to do it again. Like that, that's gotta yeah. be a terrifying thought, but still at the same time, you're like, I can't control what the offense or defense is doing. I just got to do my job. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely the specialist perspective on game day is like, you're kind of an independent party out there. Like mm -hmm. you don't know what the game plans are. You don't know what anything really is going on on offense and defense. So you get attuned to the game in a different way where you're reading the energy of your teammates and the confidence and how they feel. I mean, how they're supporting each other. You start to be really attuned into that stuff and you really just didn't feel a sense of panic. He felt the urgency to have to turn it around, stop him, or to score in that final drive, but he never felt a panic. Yeah. So it was, it was a really unique experience to have walking up and down that sideline. Tell us about that MC championship game. Uh, what do you think the mindset of everybody going into this game was? Because you're playing in SoFi Stadium, you have – the San Francisco 49er fan base that's trying to take over once again. They're trying to make sure everyone buys the tickets and there's a sea of red there. And it's a team that beat you guys twice in the regular season. And it was a tough week 18 loss, obviously in overtime. But I'm sure it must have been going through your guys' head where it's like, we need to protect our house and we have a chance to play in our house in the Super Bowl. And there's got to be some sort of feeling where third time's the charm. Yeah, it was definitely that. And I mean, you just couldn't let them take that from you because then their fingerprints would be on our stadium forever. If they won a Super Bowl in our house, um, so there's definitely that added flavor to the weekend. Um, but again, the coaching staff here has been just so awesome at affirming we just focus on what we're doing. And if we do what we do best and we do it at the level we can do it, doesn't matter who's across from us, um, which I think is true of any team that's ever made it that far. They always feel that confidence in themselves of we just have to play our game to the highest level and then see where the chips fall. Um, so you definitely felt that intensity throughout the week and that focus and everybody on your team looking at each other. There's just a different level of we've got to do this. And it was, it was really special to watch that from the sideline. And before we get into what it felt like for the clock to hit zero and what it felt like to know that you're going to the Super Bowl, I mean, you only had to have one long snap that entire game. You, yeah, you only, one you only... punt is a pretty awesome day in the office. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's, there's a sense of butterflies, but you still have this – this utter confidence in yourself. It doesn't matter how many times I need a snap, but you really hope that like everything goes perfect that everybody's blocking that you're able to cover and, and everything like you only had to do one, one long snap. That must've felt really nice. Yeah. Usually it bodes well for how the offense is doing if we're not punting a whole lot. So <laughs> yeah. that always makes you feel good when, I mean, shoot this season, we had less punts than we had touchdowns, which is pretty fantastic. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> That definitely makes your job a, a lot easier. And yeah. there's still this aspect of, you know, special teams play such a huge role in games because, I mean, just even look at what happened with the Green Bay Packers. I mean, they were the worst special teams unit going into the playoffs. And they were probably the reason that they lost that game to the Niners. Like, once again, you just allow a, a kick to get blocked. You have a punt that gets blocked. And special teams, you guys got to be – in tune it doesn't matter if you got one snap that you need to do in for the punting unit or a thousand you know that you guys gotta yeah. be in tune yeah i mean they preach it here it's on special teams it's you have to have a one down mentality because you only get one shot each time uh where offense like if you get a loss on first down you can still figure it out in second or third down mm -hmm. but for special teams it's fourth down and that's it so you get one shot to make it right and to make it count for your team to make sure it goes the way you want it to. Dude, tell us what it felt like to know you're going to the Super Bowl because this was another 
unbelievable matchup against the San Francisco 49ers. And how relieved were you? And then how elated were you to see all that confetti come down at SoFi Stadium and know that you went from a Division II tight end, turned into long snapper, turned into the man that is going with the L.A. Rams to the Super Bowl. What did that feel like, Matt? Man, it was surreal. Just, I think I was more sore from bear hugging and screaming <laughs> than I was anything else. Uh, yeah, it was just unreal. You're just so happy for all the guys around you because on a team of, you know, 70 guys, there's so many stories, so many different uh, backgrounds and lives that, I mean, have gotten them to where they're at. And a lot of these guys, that's all they've dreamed growing up was Super Bowl versus me. I just, I found this dream late. Mm -hmm. So being able to share it with an awesome group of guys is probably everything. And then getting to see your family come down on the field to celebrate with you again is just awesome. Like my dad's crying, mom's crying, wife's crying. Everybody's just freaking out with how awesome it is. Uh, it was a really cool thing. And then, I mean, I pick up my son and then I'm just a dad again. Like he's <laughs> yeah. drooling on me, he's crying. <laughs> I got to change diapers. So it's, it was honestly like my favorite part was just the balance of how awesome it is on the surface, but also it is just another game to play. Mm -hmm. So it keeps you balanced of like, yeah, it's the Super Bowl, which is crazy. And I have to take in how incredible of an experience and opportunity it is. But it is just another game and it is just another snap for me. Yeah. So it's that balanced mindset you have to have. Yeah. And I make it more than it is. <laughs> yeah. You got that next play mentality. I think that's some stuff that was instilled at us at Azusa Pacific, where it's like, you're the man for the job. Like the job is not done yet. And I'm sure like mm -hmm. you don't feel like any sort of confidence to, you don't want to end the season and say, you know, at least we were NFC champions. No. You yeah. won the NFC Championship game at SoFi Stadium, your home stadium, and you want to keep it rolling. And yeah. you you want to hoist that Lombardi trophy. And um, before we get into like how the rest of the team is feeling right now, what your Super Bowl week is is going to look like, um, tell us about Coach Heigard. Because Coach Heigard, once again, was our special teams coach who's been going to a lot of your games there along with your family. Uh, what tell us about the t-shirt he was wearing <laughs> to the game. Yeah. I mean, I owe so much of my career to that guy and just the work he's done for me mentally, physically. So I owe a lot to him and it's so special to be able to share the games mm -hmm. with him. And this man is juiced for special teams. Like his energy is unequaled. He's, his daughter's made him a shirt as has my number on it, 42, and the special teams matter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's pictures of him going nuts at the game. And it's it's really cool to be able to share it with people mm -hmm. that have had an impact on your life and especially career. Um, yeah, it's really just so much fun to be able to share it with family members and coaches who have really paved the way for me to be here. Yeah, and I know for me, like I, I couldn't like those photos enough. I wish there was a way I could just like <laughs> like it twice. I was yeah, I was so incredibly excited for you and your family. I know Coach Heigert is he's made a huge impact uh, on my life too. And that's why I love sharing some more of these stories to where like sports is so incredible and coaches play such a pivotal pivotal role in building us up as men and then in women's sports obviously building up, up women and I owe so much to to who I am because of that coaching staff there and knowing that so many people are finding success, not only in the NFL, but so many different aspects of, of society. Uh, but I definitely want you to tell us a, a little bit how uh, the team's feeling right now, because once again, you guys are going all in. You guys got Matt Stafford. You guys picked up Von Miller. You got the best defensive player in the entire world, an absolute beast. I never saw him in person until I know I was hanging out with you after the game. I was like, Aaron Donald is a – he looks like Thanos. He literally does – he yeah, looks he's like he's just – a scary dude. <laughs> I, I could only imagine – I want you to tell us what it's like in, in the weight room with him, but you guys ended up picking up OBJ as well. But uh, first off, let's start with uh, Aaron Donald. How terrifying is that guy, especially in the weight room? Uh, equal to and more than what you'd imagine. <laughs> like, he's just so strong. 
And it just seems effortless to be that strong to him too. Like mm-hmm. he'll get under the bar with whatever I was attempting to do and just rep it out like it's nothing. <laughs> like no warm up. It's crazy. Yeah. And just his explosiveness off the ball is just scary. Like people aren't supposed to be that big and that fast. <laughs> <laughs> Did he he's an absolute beast. And then what do you feel like was uh the the vibe of the Rams once you guys picked up OBJ? Because you guys obviously lost Robert Woods. I, I that is not talked about enough. Robert Woods was mm-hmm. such a in, made an incredible impact uh on the team. And obviously you got the best wide receiver, I mean, in my opinion, not just stats wise, but just like specifically this season, Cooper Cup, one of the most talented guys in football, best route runner, one of the best route runners, I, I guess. And But once you picked up OBJ, what was the vibe of the team? Did you guys feel like this is going to get us over the hump and, and take us to where we want to go? Yeah. I mean, definitely when he saw uh, how he came in, he came in and just bought in immediately and was just trying to see how he could help everybody, all the receivers, making them better from day one um, and just buying into blocking and everything he had to do as a new teammate. So you could definitely feel that excitement right away of just we've got another guy that's capable of making these showstopper plays uh, who's this bought into this team. It just affirms uh, that you really have a unique team and opportunity in front of you. Did you think about maybe turning some of your contract into cryptocurrency or did what was the <laughs> conversation like? Uh, not quite yet. I'm not in that position in my career yet to where yeah. I can – risk that one yet you're just gonna stick <laughs> with the cash i i think that's the best yeah. bet right now i think yeah i think that's fantastic but it seems like too that uh matt gay your guys's kicker johnny hecker who's been one of my favorite punters for a very very long time along with pat mcafee obviously pat mcafee's always always been up there we've had steve weatherford on the program a lot of great uh specialists but specifically you three matt gay uh johnny hecker and then you right there, Matt Orzak. You guys seem like three peas in a pod. And it seems like every single time I see a photo, it's you guys hanging out together and looking like you guys are best friends. Yeah. I mean, it was an extremely natural friendship that was built almost immediately in training camp uh, and just super organic. Like it doesn't happen very often where you just throw three people together and they're immediately – friends they have confidence in each other they understand what you need on a certain day of if you're struggling or you know anything like that um and just having a blast together Mm -hmm. like johnny's leading the way captain hecker uh we're playing games during practice when we don't have anything else going on or in the locker room for in between meetings uh and then at that same time he's a guy that's performed at the highest level He's known as one of the best punters in the game. So to have that freedom to be like, okay, we can have a blast, just have fun, and then also have an elite focus on what we have to do and have a high standard for how we should perform um, was just really a revelation as a a specialist because I was still new to this specialist role in the NFL. Um, So learning to be able to be loose and have fun with it and – the fact that you're in the NFL while also having that extreme focus and dedication to the craft. But yeah, it's, it's been probably the one of the most fun years of football in my life with those two guys. I bet. And then have you guys gotten in trouble at all during practices? Because I think I've never told anybody on the podcast, but I think, (laughs) I don't know if you remember this, but, um, and people just to understand special teams units, like, you know, this being in the NFL and like, being around specialists for a long time, we don't just snap the whole practice. We can't kick the whole practice. We got to stretch a little bit. We got to practice our drops and all that stuff. Like it only takes up so much time and Mm -hmm. there's still a heck of a lot of effort that goes into it, but we're also clowns. Like uh, Probably some (laughs) of the biggest clowns on the team are, are specialists. And I remember um, we had like our, our hell week. I guess that's probably the best way to put it. And I was just jumping on the team at Azusa Pacific and coach Beatty was our linebackers coach. So anytime you've been a part of a football team, you know, the linebackers coach is usually like one of the biggest badasses out there or one of the most hard nosed guys. And 
we got music bumping and I'm dancing around and he doesn't know me at all. He's probably just this like tall, lengthy, goofy white boy over here that's that's dancing around. And I remember just getting torn apart in front of the entire team. But I think it took a little while for me to to earn his respect. Um, and from there on out, I was like, all right, if I'm dancing, I'm doing anything like silly, I'm, I'm really going to do it when like he's not looking or that I know I'm really going to be safe. <laughs> Have you guys gotten in trouble uh, at all? Or are you guys pretty much like, hey, we, we were staying professional as much as we possibly can while at least Sean McVay is looking? <laughs> yeah, I mean, luckily enough for us, Johnny's been here for – 10 seasons so they know what they're getting with the specialist <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's uh he's made a really wide path for us to have fun in <laughs> so they, they pretty much expect us to enjoy ourselves out there and be loose and as long as you're performing at an elite level they're kind of game for whatever you're doing whatever's working you know mm -hmm. so if we're playing games out of the way <laughs> while they're practicing or doing a walkthrough that we're not a part of they're usually pretty okay with that, <laughs> but it's, we definitely sometimes push the borders a little too far. <laughs> no, as, as you should. I feel like that is just a rite of passage for specialist units. That's what, that's what you got to do is you got, you got to push the limit. You got to have a good time because Lord knows we did a lot of that at Azusa Pacific. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was really fun, but tell us about, uh, the, the vibe of the team right now, uh, the confidence of the team going into Super Bowl week. Um, give us a little bit more like inside information to like, you know, what meetings look like. Do you have some media appearances? Is it the same kind of practice schedule that you're normally used to? What does that look like? Yeah. So, I mean, this first few days was mostly just hammering out logistics and what all comes with the Super Bowl. So, you know, how the tickets work or all this stuff, how your family should come in, things that are going to be available for your families to do. Um, yeah, the media layout, when we go down to the stadium versus a normal game week. Um, so they tried to front load all that information to where we can prepare as we normally would. Um, so outside of that stuff and the few extra media appearances for more guys than usual, yeah, it's mostly business as normal. Mm -hmm. um, and the confidence in the team comes from a lot of the guys that were with the Rams when they went to the Super Bowl before, and they didn't get to, you know, come home with that trophy. So those guys are really solid veteran presence. And then also you add on top of that Von Miller, who's a guy that's been there, done it, won it, and done it at the highest level, Super Bowl MVP. Um, and he's been an awesome presence for our guys because he's just constantly preaching it like, guys, one more game. Or at first it was four games, guys, yeah. three games, two, one more game. Like, we got to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just a lot of, with a football team, with as many guys as there are, it's hard to pinpoint one person or one thing that's happening. But it's definitely feels like a really special team. And that confidence is just, it's awesome to see. And it's not an overconfidence either. It's a balanced with, like we've talked about, that focus and that understanding of the task in front of you. Like, hey, we're not playing some slappies. We're playing AFC champions yep. that have beaten some awesome teams to get here. So it's not like we're just playing another team. Like We really have to respect this opponent, understand that they're fully capable of beating anybody. So... And I think our team has a lot of maturity in understanding that. And then it must be pretty incredible to watch someone like Matt Stafford go from a place like Detroit where I have preached on this podcast so much that I am so glad that he got put on a team where you finally get to see how good this guy really is. And for me, just watching him from afar, easily one of the toughest guys that's ever played the quarterback position. The kind of stuff that he has gone through in his career – now he's in the playoffs, and it's just a new experience every single game. Like never made it to that divisional round, never made that to never made it to the championship, and definitely never made it to the Super Bowl. What's it been like watching Matt Stafford grow and evolve in LA over this past season, and especially through the playoffs? 
Um, I mean, ever since I got here and then in training camp, seeing first off his arm talent is stupendous. Yeah. <laughs> the throws he makes, the arm angles, the no looks, it's all there and it's all just jaw dropping to watch. Like sometimes you don't even notice it and they'll pull it up in a team meeting and it's like, how the heck did he make that throw? He's looking over here, sidearm, <laughs> all that stuff, and threw three guys in the coverage team. So the first thing immediately was seeing how talented he is. Um, and then the fact that he was having fun, yeah. like him and McVeigh feeding off each other, him and Coop feeding off each other, uh, and just that enjoyment that he had for it, which is such an underrated aspect and professional sports is how much fun guys are having with what they're doing. Uh, and you could really see that he was enjoying himself out there. Um, and it's just been a blast getting to watch him do what he's done this whole season. And then I definitely got like a few more questions for you before uh, we, we let you go. We want to make sure you're rested up and good. I don't want anybody <laughs> yeah. to look at this podcast and be like, you know what? Matt Orzak should have gotten some more sleep, but John Root decided to talk to him for 12 hours. <laughs> but <laughs> no, um, it's how, totally do you, fun. how do you ensure that you have fun? Because there is a sense of you want to get the job done, but how are you going to ensure that you're able to really soak in this Super Bowl experience? Because I hope you have many, many more Super Bowl appearances. But how do you take this first one here and say, hey, I want to have a good time. I want to soak all this in. I want to make sure that I make the most uh, out of this week and out of this time. Uh, it's just being where your feet are, taking in the moment that you're in and not, you know, stressing about the game and what might happen um, and just taking it moment by moment. So being able to experience what's actually happening around you and not be closing off to it because you're trying to stay focused and stay serious or um, just being able to compartmentalize and know, okay, hey, it's time to work. I'm going to work or, all right, it's just, just media or an experience for the family. I'm going to have a blast with it and just let loose. Uh, and part of that comes easily when the guys around you are the quality that they are and you want to have fun with them. Uh, your coaches all are in that same camp of, this is awesome. Enjoy it. And, you know, make the most of it. Like it's just a very unique thing to have where everybody in the building is on that same page of we can have fun. We can enjoy it, take it in. And then when it's time to work, we work. So makes it easier. Yeah. Few, a uh, few fun questions about the Bengals. Uh, just found out from part of my take that Sam Hubbard, a linebacker for the Cincinnati Bengals, says they're trying to win for Harambe. Uh, what, what do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> that's a throwback. That is, that's an awesome thing. I mean, more power to you. <laughs> like, Harambe deserves justice, even all these years later. <laughs> he deserves justice, but I think I, I'm going to be rooting for you guys. There's, there's no doubt about that. it. Yeah. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of people that are rooting for Joe Burrow. There's a lot of people that really love how he's just overtaken the league. He is the new young stud. And, man, he had some swag rolling into that AFC championship game with the shades on, the coat, the um, the ice around his neck and everything. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the thought going against somebody like that that uh, jumped in as a number one pick, got hurt, has an unbelievable comeback season, and is taking – the Cincinnati Bengals to a place they've never been before. I think it's a lot of fun. Like having awesome guys to play against is almost just as fun as having them on your team. Um, because you get to just the stakes get higher when you know there's a talented player across from you that can do incredible things. Um, so I think it just adds to how much fun it is in the Super Bowl to be playing against them for the first time for pretty much our whole team. Uh, and it is definitely hard not to appreciate the swagger and the confidence yeah. <laughs> that he has. Uh, we, I mean, you hear guys talking about it in the locker room all the time of different guys doing different stuff. And he's always, you know, he's always being spoken about in a very good way of loving what he's doing. And then a few more questions for you. Jackie Slater, 
was a L.A. Rams legend, one of the best offensive linemen in the history of the NFL. He's a Hall of Famer, and he was one of our coaches at Azusa Pacific. And you were rocking yes, his you, jer- you were rocking his jersey. That was before the NFC Championship game, right? Yep. Yeah, last week. Um, just wanted to pay homage to one of the most incredible guys and especially incredible coaches mm-hmm. that I've ever had. Uh, that dude's passion for football is unparalleled. He's awesome. Yeah. And to play 20 years at tackle for the Rams is a pretty incredible feat. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to play some or pay some respect to one of the greats of the Rams history. Do you think you guys are going to reenact Ramit? Um, and, and somebody would take over <laughs> Jackie Slater's role for that. If people don't know about that, that was just out in the set. That was the 70s. Uh, I yeah, think you got to they- look it up. Oh right man, after this. that is go on f- YouTube. Look up Ramit. <laughs> <laughs> you guys think you'll react, uh, reenact that at some point? You no, know, it's kind of hard to imagine a football team today doing that <laughs> <laughs> when you watch it. It's pretty awesome. And then finally, for you, Matt. Uh, and before my last question, I do want to reemphasize how incredible it is to see an uh, old teammate, a friend, make it to this upper echelon of of their career and i know it's so exciting to see you use your platform for good you're a great father you're a great teammate and just a great friend to so many people so i mean you're an easy guy to root for so it's it's absolutely incredible to see the opportunity that you've been provided and i just can't wait to cheer you on uh, at the super bowl but while you think about the super bowl we've had so much We've chatted about there, like, what's your mindset? Uh, what are your teammates feeling? Let's talk about the opponent. Who are you playing for this this upcoming game? Because there's a lot of people that maybe have Super Bowls of, of their own career. They reach this, this pinnacle, and sometimes people are doing it for themselves. They do it for their family. When you go into this game, who are you doing this for and who are you playing for? Uh, we talk about it at APU all the time. Uh, the audience of one. You know, we play for God the Father, the Creator. Um, and a big thing that I've always hearkened on in my life and really leaned on was Ecclesiastes 9.10, which is whatever your hands find to do, do with all your heart, all your mind. And, you know, I think there's just so much value in it because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you're doing as long as you're doing it with everything you got because our time on this earth is fleeting and you never know who it can impact by just um, having a positive outlook and, you know, doing everything that you're doing with an energy and an excitement. It's kind of a rare thing these days. Mm-hmm. Like most people dread going to work. They dread going home to their kids. They dread, you know, anything like that. So I count it all a blessing because you get to have a joy. I have tremendous joy going to work with these incredible guys that have an equal joy and more joy coming home to a wife and playing with my little one-year-old son and watching him grow um and then being able to share everything with other family and friends um it's just very special to me to be able to do well definitely best of luck too and before we go i gotta pull this out Let's go Cougs. I love it. I love to see an Aziza Pacific Cougar going to the Super Bowl. Do us all a favor, Matt. Win it. Get it done on your home field. We're all we're all rooting for you. And I hope this gets more people excited about fourth downs and field goals. <laughs> you, you got somebody to root for here, Matt Orzak. But Matt, thanks again so much for joining us here. Best of luck. Go get that dub. Appreciate it, Don.